right, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, in this podcast. Uh, we interview people who are trying to advance liberty and freedom. And today we are joined by Steve Laffey. He is throwing his hat in the ring for the 2024 presidential race. And thank you for for coming on and joining us. And uh, I hope the best of luck for you. And uh, we'll go from thank you. we'll go from there. Yeah, it's great to be out with you guys. Almost, it's like I'm almost home. But uh, almost. Although I have a lot of homes, I've lived you know a lot of my life in the deep south in my business career. But I'm from New England. I'm from the most democratic state in the United States of America as an evangelical Christian conservative. But uh, but I live in Colorado which is having problems with freedom, but go ahead. Yes. Yeah. We won't, we won't, uh, we can talk about the national issue. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the national stuff, not the, the local stuff. Um, so you are the mayor of, of Cranston, Rhode Island. Um, you've thrown your hat in a couple of races. You end up moving out here to, to Colorado. Um, ran for the house. I believe a couple of times, I believe. Is that correct? No, no, just, just one. one. And that's just special one. sort of election where, my big mistake was not knowing it was the size of Virginia. I, I'm a retail politician. If I could have met everybody I had a year, we would have won. Oh, yeah. Problem, you start driving east and you see 60 people a day. It's really rough. Anyway, in Cranston, okay. I'm used to used to just knocking on every door. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You get 60 miles between towns out here. And one of those towns, yeah, yeah like only have 60 people in it and spend all your, your day driving around just trying to talk to people everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a, it's a lot different out West than it is back East. So, yeah, but my background is, is vastly, I mean, I ran, I mean, my race in 2006 for the United States Senate was the national race of the United States of America that year. Uh, I wrote a book that was published by Penguin Books, the largest book publisher about it called Primary Mistake. My primary, the National Republican Party, Carl Rove, George Bush mistake. They backed a far left of Nancy Pelosi Republican who became a Democratic governor of Rhode Island later, left the party after he got several million dollars from York Horfers, if you're listening, you're a Republican. And it cost them a lot of races, but I've taken on, I've never had the wind at my back, you know? Uh, elected as mayor of Cranston, the city was the lowest bond rating in the United States of America in 37 days from missing payroll, which hadn't happened since 1992 in the United States of America. So my background's financial. I took the top finance course at the University of Rhode Island. I'm a graduate of Harvard Business School. I helped run a financial firm that was successfully sold for $785 million, the largest one in the South. I know money. I know finance. And as I said, when I announced over two about two months ago, we are having a giant financial problem, as my movie, Fixing America, said we would, but it's happening now. Within a month and a half, it actually happens. That's what I bring to the party, not just like hanging out like people, not a website that says give money. I provide specific solutions to solve gigantic problems, and I force people to do things that they don't want to do when they vote. That's my gift. That's why I'm running. And so, Steve, uh, I noticed on your website you put, um, you know, to put the C back in conservative. Could you maybe just touch on, um, in your mind, the dif difference between a conservative, a Republican? Um, and, you know, from everything you've said so far, I really, I just hear kind of a pragmatist, somebody who's not so obsessed with either. Can you uh, help me understand where you sit in that spectrum? Well, I can help you by issue after issue. I guess that's probably the best way to do it. I mean, a lot of people say they're conservative. I mean, I, sometimes I don't know what that means. You know, we've got to the point where, you know, under Donald Trump, there's a lot of conservative people who love what he did. I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote for him for reelection. When you run up eight trillion dollars of deficit in four years, when we as Republicans were out of our mind about Obama's eight trillion in eight years, then you're not a conservative. Number one conservative is you balance budgets. Number one, if you don't, if you can't do that, I really don't have much time for you. I, I hate to be like this to people, but if you're going to think you're going to run these major deficits all the time, like Mike Pence, we're now going for growth, quote unquote. The man who, when he was a congressman, wanted to shut the government down, right? Then you've got every U.S. senator and all but three congressmen, Ken Buck voted the right way, 
The seminal vote of whether you were conservative or not is when you did or didn't vote for the PPP program, the pay pack, Paycheck Protection Program. $800 billion. No one read it. Everybody knew it was going to friends at J.P. Morgan. We know that 70,000 cases of fraud, they got 12 people looking into it, by the way. We know Tom Brady got a million dollars. He really needed it, huh? We, we know that that was really the worst thing ever. Every, Ted Cruz voted for it. Tom Cotton voted for it. Get him on the show and ask him why. The president signed it. Nikki Haley said nothing about it. Mike Pompeo thought it was a good thing. Only Ken Buck, Tom Massey out of, Kentucky and a guy's name I'm forgetting voted voted against it. Three guys could have been three girls. It was three guys. I was on the radio. You play the tapes. This is the worst thing I've ever heard of. That's how you might want to find a conservative. Whoever. So we got three conservatives. Okay, three, and it ain't Donald Trump. And if you want to talk about education and what conservative means, it means that you get the federal government out of education. It means that you send a check if you have to every single parent and you get everybody you can out of these public schools because they failed. Today in New York state, today, they decided that they were just gonna lower the math and English standards like they've done before and call it the new normal. So that a little kid named Johnny or now Javier, whatever the name is in New York city, he is not gonna get the opportunity I got. And that needs to change. We need to get every kid we can out of the public schools. I've got the most kids in the race. I've got six. And you're talking to the only one who's educated them in Montessori schools, public schools. That was a mistake. Um, uh, private schools, Catholic schools. I personally homeschooled the last three when my daughter, Sarah Grace Laffey, came down with stage four cancer. My wife went to the children's hospital for a couple of years, 200 nights a year, basically, I opened Saxon math books and started homeschooling. I want to do like a hole in the head. But it turned out to be the best thing maybe I've ever done in my life. And it's why you haven't heard of, me, heard of me for many years. Because I decided to take care of my family first. But I learned then to become radicalized against the public schools. Because they've destroyed this great country. And they've done it on purpose. That's conservative. But I'm sorry, I, got, I went off on a topic, but we can talk more about it. But. No, no, I, I'd love to dive both into both of those. Um, yeah. Uh, with regards to the balanced budget, I noticed that the Federal Reserve is also a big centerpiece of your yes. platform. Um, can you just maybe help enlighten our audience on how those two interplay and what the relationship is between, you know, controlling spending, the national debt, and the Federal Reserve? Yeah. By the way, that is a great question, and no one ever asked it, but there is a relationship. And it's why on my website, stevelappy.com, that I say, by the way, we, it's a step too far to say anything else. But the Federal Reserve, for the first way to deal with the Federal Reserve, is to do away with the dual mandate that started in like 1977, where instead of just inflation, and it used to be kept at zero, it was now also unemployment. Now, if you took Algebra 1, you would know that if you were given like three equations and two unknowns, you could sit there for many hours and not solve, right? So it's the same thing here. Like they can't do the job. It's been fairly obvious they can't do both jobs. So let's get rid of the unemployment, full employment, send it back to somebody else. And I'll get to that in a second. Inflation should only be zero. This whole thought, by the way, that we could always be afraid of deflation the biggest growth period in the United States of America was the 1880s when prices continually dropped. The only people who hate inflation are really rich people who have lots of debt. They hate deflation. As if I said inflation, I'm sorry. They love inflation because they got fixed loans that they pay off in, with devaluated dollars. If we want the dollar to remain strong, and there's other ways to do this, First and foremost, people have to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I know one thing about America. They're not going to have inflation. They get that Laffey guy. He's either the head of the Fed, the president of the United States, put people on the Fed. He's having no inflation. He's going to follow that money supply increases times the velocity of money equals the nominal GDP. We call it MV equals PQ. It's, you learn it in macroeconomics. Today's Fed Reserve has never mentioned it in the last seven years. They never mentioned it. I just read the monetary report from last... And I shouldn't do this. It drives me crazy. 
but but they literally don't mention money supply. When they say mon in the monetary report of the United States of America by Jerome Powell, they don't mention it. So to answer your question directly, if we do that, right? And I can get 17 of my buddies from high school to keep inflation at zero. It's really not that hard. But if we do that, this is how it answers your question. All of a sudden, you have a different meeting when the Fed Reserve comes to the Congress. Very different meeting. He says, I'm keeping inflation at zero. Laffey told me to keep it at zero. It's zero. How are you guys doing? And the people of Congress fall literally off the back of their chairs because now they got to balance the budget because no one will put up with their nonsense anymore. That's the relationship that Congress finally takes over the purse strings. Somebody introduces a budget. <laughs> I mean, the president, the, the Congress votes on things. There's there's very little executive, uh, you know, uh, action. It goes back to the Constitution of how the proper ways we should function. And we don't do any of it now. Does anybody know of a real budget introduced? By the way, the most famous example of this was Paul Ryan, quasi-conservative, right? All, never had a, always in Congress, marries the daughter of someone who's a governor. He just hangs in Washington. He's now at Fox News, probably a wonderful guy. But when asked by Britt Hume in 2012, when his balance, but his budget would balance, he had a balanced budget. He kept saying it, go play the tapes. Britt Hume, great Christian conservative guy, the last guy left. He says, when does your ba budget balance? Well, blah, 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 blah. When does it balance? Third time, Paul Ryan says 2030. It's a joke. All these people operate, and I met many of them, as if, and they want to, by the way, be out of office when the collapse comes. But it's coming now. And so that's the answer to your question. I know it's long-winded for people who don't understand how the Fed operates. It's totally okay because they didn't learn it in school. They should have. But we get back to a single mandate. Inflation's at zero. The world will change. Now, we need other things, too. The world will change in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate for the better. Just, yeah, just curious, um, since you're very knowledgeable on this topic, um, the thing that kind of floats through my mind, and I don't have a good answer to this question, is is there a chance that with them driving interest rates up, they can get them high enough to cause a financial crisis in basically the banking and government sector, but it still be short of where it needs to be to tame inflation due to the you know money printing that's happened in the last fifteen years. What is it? This is these are like the two of the best questions I've ever gotten so far in the campaign. I've been I've been on I've been Good Morning America, whatever. I don't know the answer to that question either. No one really knows. But what we can say is what my movie said in 2011, Fixing America. Go watch it on Amazon. It says once we pass $20 trillion of borrowed debt, we're not going back. In other words, we can't go to normal interest rates. And people say to me, what's normal, Steve? I said, well, normal would be 6 6.5%. Over the last 35 years of our country, between one month or whatever day bills to 30-year you know, bonds, um, we borrowed at about 6%. Well, folks, $24 trillion of borrowed debt, Obama, Obama, a Biden's budget is almost as bad as Trump's, going straight up. If we were to do that, at some point, we go from borrowing $250 billion on a $4.5 trillion budget and a $6 billion spending. But but we, we, we the rates go up to we're borrowing $1.3, $1.4 trillion in interest costs per year. Well, that ain't happening, folks. So the question you have is, the, we're caught between the rock and the hard place. So, so now, what do you do? Well, what happened in this one SVB bank? And I want to just tell you, I have high criticism for Donald Trump, who's just using exclamation points. He doesn't know what's going on. High criticism for the governor of Florida, who I think disqualified himself from being president by talking about it happened because they were woke, and so did Mike Pence. I'm not sure they understand, but they shouldn't have said that. The wokeness could have been 3%, but they're broke because a lot of deposits came in from people like Roku. Who's running Roku? I'm going to put $470 million in one uninsured account. Are people out of their mind? They could have put it in one month treasuries and kept it at Schwab. I, I, right? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not wrong. But they, they need mm -hmm. the money in, in three months. They put it in three month treasuries. They could have allowed it. They just... Late, and at the end of a cycle, when there's easy money, this always happens. But the bust came because 30-year treasuries, when you look at how they're priced when rates were moving up, slams down the value. 
And anybody a year ago could have seen this. Anybody, what? It's not that SBB Bank lied. They just didn't care. I <laughs> just don't have to say. They got lazy. They just didn't care. So now it's it's every financial crisis is over the same thing. The mismatching of assets and liabilities in either or, either and, duration and amount. I mean, Chesapeake, uh, some of these oil companies, they went broke several years ago, not because they had too much debt. They had too much debt due tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know? mm. So And so the same thing is happening to America right now. And it's a very difficult situation because it's going to happen. In other words, there isn't a way. They can repress rates again and try to take them down, but then they do quantitative easing, and then you're going to have more inflation, right? Unless they pay banks, unless they pay banks not to lend, which is what they did for many years up to 2008. I know I'm being too technical for probably a lot of the stuff, but the bottom line is that money matters. And so, for example, from 2010 to 2020, money supply went up at 5% per year, M2. We'll call it, we have different views of M. We call this one M2. It's, it's the most easy one for me to find. But the velocity of money went down at about 5% per year. Allah, no inflation. Then it went up at 20%. Velocity not changed too much, kind of came down, but it was enough to cause about 8% inflation for two years. And if you're a middle class person out there and you're making 50,000 in Colorado, 150 something, whatever you live, what, you know, I don't know how you define it anymore. I can tell you how I define it. But what really happened is that they they sent you a check for fourteen hundred dollars. They took four grand out of your energy cost, four grand the next year, more in rent. And, and all of a sudden you're down 12 grand. That's what they do. That's that's how the federal government operates. And now. We're at the point where what else can they do? Is there an, is there another choice? I mean, if we wanted to go back on the gold standard, what would the price of gold have to be? Five, six thousand dollars. If you wanted to have it where people came in and got it and we have these problems. So there's a number of solutions to this. Number one would be to, to look at what I tend to do in life is that I wish I was an inventor. I wish you were talking to Alexander Graham Bell. You're not. I'm actually a guy who's a very astute financial guy, but also knows how to run people and put them in the right place, but find the best practices. So the Swiss had come up with a Swiss debt break years ago. I mean, it's one solution. 20 years ago, their debt to GDP is 24%. Today, 24%. <laughs> Ours, 100, if you depend on the, what you, more than 100 if you all the debt. But so why don't we just do that? You balance the budget over a business cycle and debt cannot grow faster than the economy. We could even put it in at within a half percentage point less so that debt would start coming down slowly. That would do a lot for people to say, okay, America's going to get its act together. I don't have to go with the Riumbi or you know, the you know, the Chinese, whatever, right? So those are some things we can do, but I seem to be the only person talking about it. What most yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and the thing I love about your platform is that all the problems you list up there are, in my mind, like, like intertwined manifestations of the same complex problem. And it's it's not a straightforward problem. And, and for example, like China, I know is a big issue for you. And they're intertwined in the sense that one, we have this huge trade deficit, which contributes to the uh, the inflation. And then but at the same time, they've also been a major uh, deflationary force in driving down manufactured goods. But then what they do with the trade deficit is turn around and buy our treasuries, which further indebts us and gives us an easy way to yeah. basically escape the fact that we don't produce the stuff we want to consume. Right. So, it, you know, am I too cynical? And, and then Social Security is a major issue for you as well. And that intertwines too, because all the excess, you know, the quote unquote, reserve fund of social security has just been rolled over into national debt. And so there's no trust fund there. There's just, you know, debt from one department of the agent, uh, government to another. Yeah. And no so, lockbox. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, they have different terms over the years, right? It's in a lockbox. I mean, um, no, so to, to, just to, you're right. It's all, it's a cycle of death. Bad public schools means people don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, just, I hate to say it so frankly, right? Yeah, it's true. Um, and 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 so the Fed Reserve they they love that I don't they don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, people and love it. Just, just to jump in, it's about. it's not that the people themselves are dumb. It's that no, they, nobody bothered to explain how the system works to them. 
Yes. And they, and they, and they, when they hear me speak, they're like, that guy knows. I don't know. I may not know exactly what he's saying because people say, be very simple. I'm like, I, I'm not going to do the one syllable things. These problems are complicated. You just need to know that I know in some ways, right? And then go check out what I'm saying because I'm right. I'm right about this. I, you're talking to the only candidate who said in 2005 public, publicly running for the Senate for a year and a quarter that I ran for the U.S. Senate. I was backed by the Club for Growth who provided me with a couple of million dollars. So I must be some guy who wants low taxes, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't have endorsed me. I raised a couple of million dollars or so. But I wrote to them, listen, I'm big on free trade. Don't get me wrong. I understand the concept. I was in Canada. They got a problem with milk, milk in, in Ottawa. Everybody's got a problem. But people who have the same relative GDP per capita and not trying to destroy each other, it's great. It's also great for us if we have free trade with Guatemala, but they only want to grow bananas. If that's all they want to do, we always have this absolute competitive advantage in Intel chips if we make them in America, right? But the real problem was never Japan. When we had the Plaza Accords, Japan was having a trade surplus. With, we have a trade deficit with Japan. Reagan had something at the Plaza Hotel, where I've stayed many times in New York. It's called the Plaza Accords in the 80s and said, listen. We got a problem with all this. You have to stop making some Toyotas in America. We, mm -hmm. you know, the ones you sell to Americans. And so that helped a lot. And of course, Japan was peaking because of the silly things they were doing and not taking over the world as it was thought. And they, you know, been going down ever since. Now finally turning around. But China's a special problem. We all knew, and I said it publicly, that they would never become a democracy by trading with them. Why do I why would I have said that in 2005? Because it's never happened in the history of the world. Someone give me an example. You give someone a better trade deal who's a communist, North Korea, <laughs> doesn't matter who it is. They say, oh, that's great. I'd love to have your constitution too. Never happened in the history of the world. But large corporations knew that they could make short-term profits is what they wanted. Again, I'm not against large corporations, but they knew it was much cheaper over there and they could use slave labor effectively. So here we are, a country that loves human rights, interferes in countries, mostly to try to bring them some freedom. Korea war, what's happened in Ukraine. I mean, there's always problems and so forth with what we do, and we don't do it right all the time. But um, so we see this and we're like, oh, okay, the lobbying power goes there. So effectively China became, Walmart became kind of the same thing. But Walmart was lobbying, we love it this way, guys. Now consumers, they're middle class people. They're like, I got to go to Walmart. I got to get something. I, you know, you're talking to a guy. This tie is made in North Carolina. The shirt is made out in Seattle. Gitman Brothers. This is a Hickey Freeman suit that I got for 300 bucks at Amazon, made in America. Not not 1,200 bucks. I my wife. I'm pretty cheap, even though I, I'm I've done okay. So so I buy stuff in America. I got three automobiles. They're all made in America. When I go to buy a new tire, I look for the B6. Or the B something. I have a list of where they're made. The Birmingham, Alabama. I buy Michelin's made in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, I couldn't find one time. I got one in Nova Scotia. But it wasn't made in China. You know, So the same thing's been happening here. This is a terrible thing. Now, for everybody to understand this, there's another equation the first time you take economics. C plus I plus G plus X minus M equals your gross domestic product. Consumption, which everybody is concerned about. I'm not. Investment, nobody's concerned about. I am, because it leads to the long-term for success for our country. G, way too big, that's government. X minus M, exports minus imports. We're running 300, we're running 2% of GDP negative every year. Well, that's why our country hasn't grown a 3% GDP number, print nominally in 17 years. We need, we need it to be zero. I mean, by the way, it's not, a, it could be negative for a while. There are things that we could, I get it. But the one we have with China growing to nearly $400 billion a year is a joke. Because think about this one equation if you're you have kids. They want to have a war with us. They've actually said, we want to destroy America. We're like, well, okay, let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing it. It doesn't matter what we say or do, or they do. We just keep doing it right? It's a total non sequitur. Everything about it. They got a million people in concentration camps. Whoa! Well, let's keep trading with them. They just took over Hong Kong in violation of 1997 agreement with the UK. Whoa. Let's keep trading with them. So this is, so think about their 20% profit margin on $400 billion of export gain that they have with us. 
it's like 80 billion. It's yeah. like, it's like, add it's like coal and add the uh, plastics yeah. in the ocean. And no, add, add, add a, yeah, add up, add up everything else, just, right? It, the whole thing's a bad situation. So <laughs> let's get out of it. Let's raise tariffs for a certain level. Let's tell companies to do that. Let's, by the way, mm -hmm. it's not subsidize Intel to have a chip here, plane here. Let's mm -hmm. just say that 65% of all chips in these industries have to be made in North America or UK yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, it feels anyway, like China I, might be our like what what Russia was to Europe in the last decade. China is to us. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'm sure you know the story of you know Europeans basically buying tons of energy from Russia and basically loading them up with cash, and then right. here we go. And now it's like now we have to defend against Russia. I feel like we're doing the same thing to China. We're just enriching them, empowering them, getting them to a position where they feel bold, emboldened enough to do you know, to flex That's their right. muscle at the world stage. And you're talking to the only person running for president who's consistently said this message publicly since 2005, in fact, made a movie about it. A third of Fixing America, the movie, is simply about China and what's going to happen. So I hate to be Jeremiah of the Old Testament, right? Because because I've been right and it's not great, but it's actually happening now, which is why I decided to run now, to hopefully catch on with for the somebody to say, Hey, you know, why don't we go with the guy who's been right? He seems to know what the hell he's talking about. Rather than, I want to get this, why, why some people, you know, Nikki Haley's running because I don't really know. The website doesn't say, but she says she has a kid who has trouble buying a home and a kid who is in college and is dealing in writing, in writing woke papers to get A's. I've got three kids at CSU. They don't write any woke stuff. They're evangelical Christian kids and they're conservative because I raised them and my wife raised them and they're writing what, what they want. And they're getting A's. So I don't know what. So, I mean, to think that that people say things that I can't believe they say. You ever see the TV shows where it's like, I can't keep my kid off the cell phone. What are you saying about yourself? 30 years ago, no one would say that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I can't keep my set of kid off TikTok. I'm like, you're, you're a terrible parent. What are you doing? Take take the cell phone away. Anyway, we're off topic. I'm sorry. No, no, so, <laughs> you got so, some really good questions. Yeah. Going back to, to China, do you see an opportunity to have Mexico play a, a role in a partnership yeah. with America to basically offset that risk of China? Mexico and countries to the south of Mexico should what we be what is what we should be looking for, which we never do, as ways to grow, become democracies, and settle down this crazy immigration thing. Because I've been to Guatemala. It's a long, funny story about giving away a fire engine that I didn't know would lead to me being El Carde for, and being a special guest with the government and in and, 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 uh, Guatemala. And it's a whole thing you can read about and organizing 30 vehicles to go down there and saving lives and whatever. It was just an inadvertent thing where a guy came into my office as mayor and showed me horrible pictures of what they use for ambulances. And I thought he wanted like a thousand bucks. And I ended up giving him an ambulance, which led to me giving them more and everybody else chipping in. So I've also been across the border into Mexico. And I think the next president, instead of just going down there for a day, it's hard to go across. It was dangerous. Uh, I was in Altar, Mexico. You can look at look up Nation Magazine, Steve Laughing, and find me across the border with a Christian pastor and a bunch of people. And when you do that as a Christian, you you uh, or as anybody, you if you don't develop some empathy for what's going on, you you know, you see a bus get you see a pregnant lady get off. You see her with a kid. She has no money. She's not even calling the coyote. Everybody's rushing to a phone. She's starting to walk. It's 30 miles to the border. I mean, you're like, we got to go stop. No, we can't because we're going to get killed if we try to help people. You see an unaccompanied female, an Asian girl, who's going to be raped at the border and you can't help her? I mean, this is a human crisis. And so, yes. We focus in on the Palestinians every day and every night in the Middle East. And I don't mean to make fun of it, but we ought to just shift our attention to Mexico and everything south. Bring back the Monroe Doctrine, which John Kerry said doesn't exist anymore, and and say Venezuela, those guys leave. Warships pulling pulling in from Iran, and they're going to be sunk. This is our hemisphere, and China, you're not coming in here. And these countries need to be vibrant democracies, and we're going to work on and making sure that happens. I love that. I love that. Yep. Um, Todd, do you, you have any questions? No, you always seem to be the one that has the greatest, you know, the greatest <laughs> question. So <laughs> I am not going to roll, you know, try to 
If I get to be president, you can do the first question at the at the press conference. I appreciate that, Steve. Thank you very much. It'd be an honor. Um, so so maybe just to voice a voice of a thought, which I have to admit, I I kind of I have it. I'm sure a lot of our viewers and, and listeners have it. Is this notion of a, a uniparty? And it, I know it's a cynical belief that basically the two parties are just a fanfare that keeps the you know populace entertained. You know, my team, your team. Uh, let's let's get lined up and you know get into arguments and heated debates. But at the end of the day, for the core issues like you're talking about, when it comes to you know national defense or national offense, let's call it, uh, let's call it you know China, let's call it um, spending and printing money. Like they always seem to line up, and they always yeah. seem to have just kind of a unified front. And it's always some kind of emergency that is you know used as an as a excuse for for kind of coalescing against uh, around something they want to do anyways what's your thought on that yes there's an old cartoon that you may be too too young to remember but uh maybe you are todd but there's an old cartoon it's not the wily coyote but it's a coyote he shows up and he clocks in and then the sheepdog shows up and clocks in they fight all day they whip each other around and they clock out at night having been in washington having been with Chuck Schumer, having been with Jack Reed, Democrats, you know, and and been with Republicans, you know, um, many Republicans. I would have to say that, yes, what, what drives people is power and they want to stay in power. Why, why don't they have 70% of people want term limits and there's never a vote, right? So the president won't do it because he's sort of with them on this stuff. And so you get these small throwaway things. I just wrote a little thing for Subtech. Here, here's one of the all timers. It's 2008. Crisis is happening. I'm riding down and I'm in Nesbitt, Mississippi on Pleasant Hill Road. I'm going west. And I hear on the radio they're going to increase FDIC insurance from $125,000 an account to $250,000. i am looking here. I'm looking there. I think to myself, I could drive to the California coast and not see anybody on either side of a road like this that has $125,000 in a bank. I mean, but what were they about to do and what we're doing? Taking all the interest away from the person who just an average guy. He's 43 years old. He's got $50,000 in a bank, gets 3% on cash. He bought some CDs. He's not really a stock guy. He's got some cows, whatever he's doing, right? He, but he's doing the right thing. He wants to save and this and that. So, they take a trillion dollars plus, way more than that, away from all these people over the next 12 years. What kind of deal is that? It's it's almost like they said it was an equal, they, they presented it as sort of like, well, we're going to give you this and we'll take away that. It seems to be like totally one-sided, right? But both Republicans and Democrats on, on both sides kind of afford this stuff. And those are the big things. It's just like going back to the PPP program. Nobody in the right, by the way, my comments on the Jimmy Lakey show and other shows here in Colorado were like, you can go play the quotes. That's why I keep all the tapes. You know, you can hear me say in April, listen, the president needs to say one thing. In America, everybody goes to work. And I've got a problem with a daughter with cancer. That's my problem. That ain't your problem. Got really old fat person in a, in a in, go, go take care of him. This thing's going to affect. But then it becomes this whole thing that people get united about, about, again, not China. I call it the Chinese virus. I've been told not to say it's insulting. I'm like, well, it came out of China. I said back, I listened to a microbiologist. It obviously came out of a lab. We're finding out that, out that it did. I mean, obviously it did, right? I think probably inadvertently, because if you wanted to kill a lot more people, you would have done it differently, but whatever. Why don't we do right now? Where's the motion right now to do what we did to the tobacco companies? Not that, that I thought we should have. But in like 98, there was a settlement. Their, their stuff was held in abeyance. Why don't we take the $1 trillion plus that China has in, in our treasuries, hold them in abeyance, have a trial, and see if it really did, and then give it to the victims? There's, there's nobody who thinks that's a good idea, except me. I mean, I mean, there's nobody who thinks of this stuff because get to, to answer you, they're kind of all in on it. And the PPP program, for anybody listening, is the real thing. Because if you were close to J.P. Morgan, like, listen, I come from I come from a humble beginning, five kids, father was a tool maker, but I've hung around with some of the wealthiest people in, the, in America. And I know what goes on. So I, I actually know this. I went to Harvard Business School. 
I know what goes on was in finance. And everybody knew who was going to get these loans. We knew JP Morgan was geared up to get the best loans for their people. I know a law firm where partners got $56,000 a partner were never laying anybody off. Mm -hmm. well, but everybody in Washington knew that. Both parties, and except for three people, they all did it. And the President Trump signed it, which, in my opinion, disqualifies him from being president. I mean, I hate to say it this way, because he did a lot of good things. It's good judges, right? So I'm, I don't say, I'm not a never-Trumper, but I'm just a guy that says, that's good, that's good, that's good. This is really bad. <laughs> and I don't know why people are incapable of doing that. It's not impolite. It's not attacking. I, I see him with his family. By the way, Donald Trump's talking about alcohol one day on Fox News. Someone showed me the clip. I've actually never had a drink in my life. And I believe what he said, talking about his brother, Fred. I was like, this should be shown to everybody. Like, it was very heartfelt. So he's done some good things. But you can't be saying, I want more of those negative interest rates. That's not okay with me. So I never voted for him, just so you know. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not Speaking of those rates, uh, and, and I know you've kind of brought up Silicon Valley Bank earlier. Um, this is another one of these where do you feel like the there's any correlation with whose money was at stake and the decision to, you know, bail them out? Yes. Uh, obviously, they weren't going to bail people out. They had a weekend to think about it. And what happened was very powerful people who give lots of money to corporations and to uh, to me to politicians through 50C 34s or whatever you want to call these things and they changed their mind now that was a terrible decision for a number of reasons so for people listening so in Colorado so you have a $500,000 home you insure it for $500,000 and when it burns to the ground it costs $700,000 you didn't put a rider on for the rebuilding thing they send you a check for 500 grand and you're like okay you don't say hey i need 700 grand you look at mm -hmm. your policy it says 500 grand mm -hmm. this policy says 250 now, there's not even money to cover the two fifty thousand dollars mm -hmm. account. Just you know, there's like two percent of that lying around. We pay into it when we have these accounts. People don't know that either, mostly. But to insure above that, for Roku has four hundred and seventy million dollars. When will people learn a lesson? For I mean, on any topic, when will people learn a lesson and stop behaving like complete numb nuts? I mean, there was no reason for anybody to have all that money in a bank. Like I said, you could have it in treasuries, you could have it in foreign, you could buy it in French francs, you could put it, whatever. There's a lot of things. When you're, if you're in charge of cash management or the CFO of Roku, it's not that hard to kind of make a little extra money with very safe investments. You find out what you know, Magellan funds. I mean, and you spread it around. I do that and I'm not Roku. So, so the absolute laziness, but why did he do it? Why did the guy at Roku do it? Well, he's been around a long time. He watched banks get bailed out in 08, and J.P. Morgan didn't take the hit. The guy who runs J.P. Morgan's a billionaire. He should be worth zero. Whole other topic about white-collar crime we could get into. What about the airlines? Everybody watched the airlines. So here's what airlines do. Companies like airlines should never have any debt. They're extremely cyclical companies. They all have a lot of debt. So, so 2008 comes, they get bailed out to the tune of like, I don't know, $50 billion, right? What do they do between 2009 and 2020? Go look up the, the guy who runs America, who just retired American Airlines. They buy back stock way above book value, thereby in decreasing their book value. They take on lots amount of debt and they play a game of roulette, hoping to get out. And this guy did before it crumbles again. When it crumbles, what do they say? I need some more uh, money. And they get it. That should never happen. So especially like, like say, airlines. Due to regulation, airline stocks go to zero. There's nothing wrong with the plane. There's something mm -hmm. wrong with the, the stockholders. They have no money. Mm -hmm. But the plane flies. They put gasoline, you know, or jet fuel in it. They have to. It just keeps going. What's the big deal? And so because we didn't do that and it keeps getting bigger, it is now too big. You might remember the guy who ran for governor of New York and he said the rent is too damn high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. the debt is too damn big, folks. And we're not getting out of this, this one without lots, without me or someone like me. But this here's the thing. There's nobody like me. I, I don't want I sound like Donald Trump. I don't mean to be less than humble. I'm the only guy who can come on this show and talk like this. I have no notes. There's no, there's nobody there. Like 
I can tell you the answers to these problems because I spent my life on them. I taught the top finest course at URI. Nobody, Nikki Haley doesn't know. What, they don't know what they're talking about. And by the way, if, if, if this situation didn't call for a financial expert, I wouldn't run. I have a very nice life in Fort Collins. I got the last 20 acres left with some cows. And I pretend to be a rancher. I'm really not. I mean, I did pull a calf out of a heifer one day with some chains. Oh, you're, you're there. Well, that was, that was unusual. So uh, we got chickens and all that kind of stuff, but I, I'm, I really know this and it's my time. And, you know, I became friends with Herman Cain, who I liked a lot. That's where I got the 999 plan. Again, I didn't invent it. People told me, if you go to my website, you should make it your own. I'm like, Herman Cain was a really nice guy, but a totally nice guy. I met him after the election. I wish he had been president. And his plan is correct. It's not just correct by me. You can, but 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 if you really want to see what the inside group is about, about, watch rewatch the 2011 debate when Herman Cain was hot, and watch Rick Santorum, and watch Mitt Romney attack him as if he's he's got no brain, except he has mm-hmm. a master's in math. <laughs> so so. So it, it really was incredible to watch this and then watch the morning show. You can't do that. You can't do that. And then watch some s- decent economists go on and say, what are you talking about? We're going to raise a lot more money. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll catch, capture everybody. We'll capture every illegal alien buying bubble gum. If you want a wealth tax, let a guy buy a $40 million boat. We'll just take three and a half million bucks. And, you know, So you're not going to get it by taxing this billionaire tax. You're not going to get it, but we need more revenue, but we need it in a simple, slightly progressive, but low rate, right? We can give some money back or not tax people in the first, whatever. I know that, but it, it doesn't have to go past nine. Now, Herman and I joked one day that, you know, it might to be the 10, 10, 10 plan because of debt's so big. <laughs> so, but unfortunately he's passed away, but I, I was very blessed to become, become friends with him. And, and I'm, perfectly happy to say that I don't think all these things up. I just spent a long time thinking, talking, and putting together what I think will fix this country. I even made a movie about it. So that's who I am. Gosh, and it, it's so important. Uh, I mean, just to, on a personal note, I um, I was born in Yugoslavia, right? Wow. Before they went through the hyperinflationary cycle. And Wait, so when it was Yugoslavia? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, so in a weird way, I kind of feel well prepared for what we're about to face because yeah. I at least have seen it play out once. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you know that story, that it doesn't play yeah. out that well. So no, it's kind it of unfortunate. Civil war and, you know, I mean, I'm not Tito, but, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that's amazing. You were born in Yugoslavia. We don't see that. I don't see that at all. Yeah, I, I like to joke with people that I was born as a billionaire. It's just that I couldn't really buy anything with the money. So Right, right. I mean, people don't know all those things put together to hold Yugoslavia together, right, with all the things over the years and tito being sort of the guy who was uh, the only guy who could really kind of stand up a little bit to stalin i suppose right yeah and, yeah and, uh, and america's pretty homogenized and it obviously doesn't have the history of no, conflict no. that that region of the world does so I, I hope it fares much better but at the same time it's like we seem pretty divided and you know yeah. you we know, are very gonna, divided yeah we and you know what's going to be a, a, a big accelerant to that is is a is a massive devaluation of the currency and yeah you know, it's it's like it's like jet fuel in that situation. Yeah, it's very, very sad because it doesn't have to be that. I, I will tell you that I really believe this one thing, though. Uh, I was elected mayor as an evangelical Christian conservative in the most liberal state when this only when the timing was right, when the bond rating went to the lowest in America, a nine zero Democratic city council and a Democratic mayor. And they were in Rhode Island. They could have all been Republicans. Same corrupt disaster. It doesn't matter. And I told people when I campaigned, they really wouldn't like what I was going to do. But I did not come back home after 20 years, 18 to 38, roughly, to live in Detroit. And if you Mm -hmm. voted for me, you probably wouldn't like it. But at the end, you would thank me because it would be corrected quickly. And it was. And I ran for re-election, got the highest amount of votes of anybody ever running for re-election in Cranston's history. But the day before the election, I'm running down the street. If you look me up, I like to run down streets and knock on doors. And so my my high school economics teacher who taught me a lot of the stuff I talked to you about. Ladies rolled down the window. Come over, talk to her. I look down. She looks up. She goes, I hate you. And I said, oh, I've heard that before. She goes, oh, I'm voting for you tomorrow. I just didn't like it. And I said, I told you you wouldn't like it. She said, you did. And she drove away and I got 60 some odd percent of the vote. <laughs> so, so you know, really, you know, it, so people can be united. And would be willing to say, okay, Lappy says in the Social Security plan, if I'm 47, I could get a little bit less. 
Okay. Okay, I can do that. As long as there's what something for my kids, right? A lot more for you, my kids. And the old people, they're gonna get whatever they whatever they said they were gonna get. Okay, we're gonna take $61 trillion out of the core structure of America that'll help the dollar. Okay, as long as it's fair for everybody, most Americans will be like, okay. What they don't think is that it's fair. Like I just gave you the FDIC example. That's like one of a hundred, right? We can sit here mm -hmm. all night. Well, I've got to go. You've got to go, I'm sure. But if they thought it was fair, if I can break through to enough people and they say, this is this guy, he's got these six kids. He knows what the hell he's talking about. He's been through this stuff. Like, let's do what he says. Let's, he, he's going to go to, he's not going to do it. We're not going to do any executive orders, by the way. Like, this is dumb. They don't last. So they're sort of dumb anyway. We'll go to Congress, hit them with a budget. Right. Put in the Swiss debt break and then then get on a train and have people come to Washington, a la Andrew Jackson. I mean, I was able to get twelve hundred people to go to several Cranston City Council meetings. The rooms only held eight hundred. You could see the videos of these things. You ever see twelve hundred people go to a city of eighty three thousand people? You've never seen it. You've never seen this scene. But in the end, they were clapping because they knew once I cut everything out of the budget, I could. I had to raise taxes. They were clapping at the end when I started cutting square dancing. Like, we're not doing square dancing. I've seen something. That's 400 bucks. I mean, <laughs> and, and so they knew it was fair. And finally, they were like, it's fair. Okay, I'll do it. And the city of Cranston's bond rating went up eight notches in three and a half years. It's never been done in American history. And we, was, and we were back to, like, a normal city. Mm -hmm. And it can't yeah. happen in America. It can happen rapidly. It's just going to take leadership. And for the American people to say, you know what? We'll, we'll fight later. Like the, like the coyote thing. We'll fight later. Let's just get this thing fixed because I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. That's where I am. Right. I don't right. know if you I, I can't do the TV show. I can't do it. I can't do the shows. I just need it to be fixed so I can go back to my farm. And if someone else wants to do it, I'll go back to my farm tomorrow. But nobody wants to fix the thing. They just want to look at the attacks that are going on. SVB Bank went down because of some woke policy. Listen, the woke policies in schools, if they're all corrected tomorrow, you've got textbooks that are 30 years old, missing 20 pages of a math book in Detroit. They're not going to learn anything anyway. If there's no wokeness. Now, wokeness is bad. I get it. But they're not going to learn anything anyway. The schools are broken. But if you that's all we focus on, then little Johnny doesn't learn anything tomorrow morning. And that's what drives me because I got to learn. Because you can tell. Something happened to me from a poor family that I got to learn. My oldest brother died of AIDS. My other brother's been locked up. He tried to burn down the Institute of Mental Health while he was in it, while I was mayor. He has schizophrenia. My sister had schizophrenia. The, my youngest sister, she, she's passed away now. It wasn't, but I, by the grace of God, was able to get out of there. But I know what people go through. And I know I'm the right person to fix this. It's just a question of, can we get to enough people somehow like Herman Cain did at one point, all at once. And if we can, I got a chance to fix the whole thing. And I tried to. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's messy. It's like, first people have to understand that inflation is really a tax. And then they have to understand that not only do they inflate away, uh, you know, at whatever the CPI shows, but they also inflate away all the productivity gains of the private sector, because, you know, at zero yeah. would still be eating away the productivity gains of the private sector. And yep. I was just running some crude numbers. If you look at it that way, the spending of the federal, state, and local governments amounts to 37% of the economy, of the GDP. So basically, our tax rate on average across the entirety of the country is 37%. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's and I, what I love about your platform is that you, you take a big problem, you focus on it, you don't come in trying to pretend that you're going to save all 15 major problems you focus on the core big ones and, and that's that's all you I, I think want to be held accountable to is that fair to say yeah i mean i'll get to healthcare at some point because i because it's eight because you know it's 18 percent of gdp and it should be 12 at the most so there's a trillion bucks so i i, I we won't bother you with it tonight but <laughs> i thought i'd have something to add in a couple of months so people would say hey he's he's doing something new but yeah i i enjoy by the way hammering one point until I get it done. I don't have an enjoyment like everybody else of like five minutes, new cycle changes. Right. And then people come to me even now. What do you think about this? I'm like, I don't think anything. Of it. What about Trump's indictment? I don't think much of it. I got, I got, I'm not doing this. This is what's going to help my six children have the life. And they will, because they have me. 
the six children like little Steve Laffey somewhere in Cranston, Rhode Island, to get the same shot. Now, if they blow the shot and do drugs, that's their deal. Mm -hmm. But we want, what do we want the most? Everybody to get a shot. You know, I mean, it's funny you say in Yugoslavia. I, I think I may use this in, in the future. I don't think I use Yugoslavia, most people. But if I got 17 people from Venezuela who had lost everything under Chavez and put them on the Federal Reserve Board, you think we'd have inflation? <laughs> no. That's my new line. I just yeah. got to... I don't think I can say Yugoslavia, though, but because well, people go, where is that? Throw a few Yugoslavians in there. Come on. <laughs> yeah, one and one Yugoslavian. Yes, 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 yes. I'll apply for that job when it comes. Um, yeah, no, awesome. Well, Steve, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's it's clear you're a, a financial expert and, you know, the country needs you. And, and best of luck in the election campaign. And please we'll let us know how we can help. Well, uh, uh, I... Send me the podcast we have done. Send it to everybody. It's stevelaffy.com. Go there. Put in a little bit of money. Send me an email. I'm going to be – this is this is very early. I announced very early. I've been on a lot of shows. But I obviously, I need to get on a lot more, and I need people to listen. And and I think people are starting to, and I think we're breaking through. I'm he heading to Washington, D.C. to do a major TV show that will be played around the country. Uh, the the AFP, the international, the largest news organization in the world, just followed me around for a day. There'll be something coming out about that. A lot more has to happen. I get it. But, you know, at my age, 61, I haven't lost my faculties. I think it's the right age that I could actually say, I'll do this for the country for another period of time. If I can win, I'll do it for four years. But if someone else just does it, fine. I, I You know, I'm perfectly happy. But if these kind of things aren't done, we're never getting back. We're never getting the country back and it could easily split apart at some point in the next several years because now is the financial crisis i'll leave you with that it's now it's not next year. it's it's now and that's why i announced like a month before it started because i knew it was now great well thanks again steve uh, we hope to have you again you. in the future yeah let's do it again i appreciate yep. it so i'll be home to colorado to visit i live there but i'll be home soon anyway god bless guys i appreciate it yep thank you okay